I'm sitting on the wing of the Sling, I guess this is the Sling 2, because there is now a Sling 4. This is a Sling with the 912 IS in an engine in it from Rotax, and that's a bit of a change for them, but the aircraft has now been around for a little while. This is a South African designed airplane. The main man behind it is Mike Blythe, and Mike Blythe first got on the radar of many people because he did some very very long flights he did a flight from south america up through north america across the atlantic all the way down, down through europe and all the way back down to south africa uh, something like twenty-five thousand miles and he did that all in a weight shift aircraft so that's kind of the background of the man behind this airplane then he moved from his uh, trike interest into fixed wings and he's designed this particular airplane now there's a sling four and those two, he's flown some very long distances. Uh, Sling has gone around the world, I think, twice now. I know twice now. And Sling 4 has gone around the world. This is all the way around the world. And, in fact, the Sling 4 and the first of these Sling 2-place machines did so very soon after the design was completed. So if that's not showing some faith in the design, well, I don't know what does. So Sling here, both the two and the four-seater, they're all metal airplanes. They're riveted construction wings, some limited use of fiberglass components, uh, engine cowl, landing gear, uh, wheel fairings, that is, things like that, uh, but very conventional in many ways. It's also, as you can see here, I'm going to turn around and move it a little bit. It's a sliding canopy um, aircraft, and for a lot of people, that's a big advantage uh, because you can let a little air in very easily while you're uh, ground taxiing. The aircraft uh, is, as I said, side-by-side two-seater. Uh, this one's beautifully done with some nice leather appointments. It's very comfortable inside. Uh, the seats uh, adjust. The rudder pedals also adjust. And the human factor side of it is it's very good. Uh, throttle in the center with the brake right alongside it so one hand can work both of them. And because the aircraft comes from the same country of origin that the instruments come from, uh, they're kind of co coordinated, you might say. These use MGL avionics, which the same individuals in the United States and South Africa sell. And, of course, both products are sold around the world. Sling has done quite well. Um, so I don't have an exact count on the number flying worldwide. Uh, my guess is at least a couple of hundred. But I know in the United States there are about 20 flying and are 20 sold in the United States. Not all of them are flying yet. And the reason why is this. You can buy the Sling as a SLSA, Special Light Sport Aircraft, that is fully built aircraft. You can also buy it as an experimental amateur built. And some of them are being sold that way. So it's some of those that are not yet uh, operating in the United States. Uh, the kit build effort is about, uh, about a thousand hour kit, I understand. And when you home build the airplane, now you can put for example, a constant speed prop on it and get some extra performance out of it. Some uh, steep banking while we did the uh, pilot report and uh, the aircraft can carry up to 1,550 pounds, I believe was the number. And here in the United States under LSA, it's only 1,320. So you can get both some extra speed through a constant speed or in-flight adjustable prop uh, in addition to some additional loading inside the aircraft. It's a very solid feeling airplane reflecting perhaps that higher weight capacity. Uh, it's a very snappy handling airplane. You see that in the pilot report where we were able to uh, go 45 to 45 in less than two seconds, and yet it doesn't want to get away from you. It's a very cooperative airplane in its handling, uh, what Matt continually called a gentleman's airplane in that you didn't have to be on it all the time. One of the most interesting aspects about it perhaps was that it does very, very nice landings. I had two excellent landings on it, and I'm... Uh, Perhaps I have some skill, but I think it's a lot to do with the airplane. Of course, with any airplane, you have to fly the numbers and handle it the right way. And the numbers in this airplane are to come in at about 75 uh, knots. And while that seems a little fast, the energy dissipates quickly, as it does with most light aircraft. So coming in at 75 knots with full flaps means the nose is pointed down pretty good. 
you can see exactly where you're going to land. As you get down to the ground and do your round out, the airplane will slow down very quickly, and it can land at about 300 feet, um, even at full gross. You can also take off on a quite, quite a short distance at full gross as well. For example, they're operating off the Sun and Fun runway at the show down there in Lakeland each year. That's a 1,400-foot runway. It's grass, so grass provides quite a bit of dragging action as you do your initial rollout acceleration. And they said they used about 900 feet, so they had plenty of room left over. So that's pretty good, and on paved surface, obviously, it can do much better. The aircraft is being used in a couple of flight schools at least. I think there were three that he mentioned to me, one in uh, Southern California at the John Wayne Airport, which, although it has airline traffic, is also a very busy flight training airport. And Paul Hamilton up in uh, Nevada, uh, near Reno, Nevada, also uses one in a flight training environment. So I said controlling the airplane is very easy. Well, how do you control it? Inside the aircraft, it's a full dual control setup. Both sides have joysticks. Both sides have rudder pedals, which I think I mentioned do adjust fore and aft by pulling a pit pin and then sliding them, sliding the rudders on a, uh, a tube that allows about four inches of travel. So that would accommodate eight or nine inches of height difference between people. But the seats also move fore and aft, but the travel on the base of the seat, the seat cushion, is a fairly substantial, look like about six or six or inches or more. So combine the six inches or more of travel of the seat and the rudder pedal adjustment and they can accommodate, they said pilots from five foot two to six foot seven have been in the airplane in the flight school environment. Steering was very precise on the airplane. It, uh, in, in many general aviation airplanes, you sort of bear down on the rudder pedal and you kind of wait and it sort of slowly will come around. Quite hard to maneuver some of those very tightly. This does not have that problem at all. It maneuvers very quickly on the ground. And yet, once again, although it moves quickly, I didn't notice any problem in holding it straight either. So between the two occupants, there is a very substantial throttle handle. I'm kind of looking in the airplane to review my thought. And right alongside it is the handbrake. Now, the handbrake operates both brakes at the same time, so it's not, not differential braking. That, again, is very common on light sport aircraft. So uh, as you have your hand on the throttle here, you can kind of have your hand near the handbrake, too. So the fact that they're near one another just makes it a very small hand motion. Uh, flaps are operated by a switch, uh, a rheostat type switch with four posi or three positions, while well, four, one is neutral, uh, then 10 degrees down, 20 degrees down, and all the way down. It just says down on the indicator alongside it, and that's 30 degrees. And that's what you would use uh, for, oh, well, most landings, they said, except that they would only use 20 degrees in windy conditions. We did one each way. We did one at 20 degrees and one at 30 degrees. And indeed, at 30 degrees, the nose angle is down pretty sharply, which is good. You're seeing right about where you're landing. And you can just sort of move the airplane down to that position and then flare. And with 30 degrees, it flaps down. You're going to lose energy pretty quickly because that's a lot of drag being created. Um, the flap indicator is interesting. On the MGL Avionics, uh, both the flap indicator and the trim indicator are shown right on the flat screen that comes from uh, MGL Avionics. This has the 10.4 inch, two of them, uh, diagonal um, EFIS that they have in there, and they are all touchscreen. This was a company that had touchscreens before anybody else. Now they're quite common, but they've really executed it very well. And one of the ways that it's so neat is that they have a checklist on the screen as well, which checklist is just a flat checklist. He called it a flat screen instead of having um, buttons that you have to push for each item, which would be kind of annoying and laborious to have to click off each item. You just see the entire checklist, three or four pages of them, and then when you click them, when you touch on it, it goes to the next screen. So that's a very handy way. You don't have to worry about your checklist papers blowing around in the cockpit, or you forgot the book back in the hangar or something like that. Uh, you've always got them with you thanks to the EFIS, which shows the flap and trim indicator, as I said. It also controls the uh, radio, which is also from MGL Avionics, so it's all very nicely integrated control panel throughout, and you can just touch on the radio uh, on the flat screen. That'll bring up a panel, which then you can adjust the radio controls, or you can just touch on the airport you want to talk to, which will bring up airport information, and then you just hit the control tower, for example, and that will reflect right away on the radio. So all over, it's a very nice integration. Same thing with the transponder, and I'm sure that's true with the autopilot as well, although we did not use the autopilot. 
in front of the throttle is a great big, uh, the large size, as you see in some other airplanes, fuel selector uh, left, right, and off. And uh, the airplane holds 40 gallons of fuel. So we mentioned that while we were doing the pilot report that at the lower fuel consumption of the Rotax 912 IS engine, if you throttle back a little bit, and you've got full tanks of gas, 40 gallons, you can fly for something like 11 hours, which honestly is a lot longer than I care to be in an airplane. But these guys are used to going around the world, so I guess that's pretty normal. So 40 gallons of gas, 20 on each side, and you can switch back and forth to improve your loading characteristics if that's a factor for you. Can the canopy closed? Uh, you've got tremendous upward visibility in the airplane. You've got good visibility out to the sides. Of course, you can't see directly down because the wing's in your way, but you've got great visibility. and at speeds under 80 knots, you can bring the aircraft, uh, the canopy back to about this far, which you have to hold in position uh, because the canopy naturally wants to close by the wind pressures that are on it. But you can hold it about a foot or so open and that would allow a lot of air in. Of course, when you're taxiing, you have it all the way back and you've got lots of airflow. In flight, you can see there's a na one of these NACA inlets right here. And inside there is a vent that you can aim at you and that brings in, these, these things work really well, they bring in a lot of air. So that's a lot of information about the Sling and its big brother, the Sling 4, the four-seater. Uh, all from the Airplane Factory. That's the name of the company is The Airplane Factory. That's the South African name. The folks in the U.S. use airplanefactory.usa. So if you go to the main company website, that's just airplanefactory.com. You can find lots more than we told you here. But we hope you enjoyed our review of the airplane here at Copper State at Casa Grande Airport, just south of Phoenix, Arizona. And you can find lots more about all kinds of affordable aviation on bydanjohnson.com. Appreciate you joining us. Thank you.